So, um, thanks, Marcus, and thanks for your letter for organizing this. Uh, uh, it's, it's really great to be here. Um, uh, as Marcus said, uh, we come with three authors, come from different disciplinary backgrounds, and you can probably also hear from the accents that we come from different national backgrounds, uh, that Marcus is uh, from Germany. Um, I'm originally from the... Uh, uh, um, what's still a member country of the European <laughs> Union. Um, <laughs> and uh, uh, Jean-Pierre uh, Lando is uh, very, very characteristically French. If he were here, you would, you would feel the Frenchness. Um, and the question that we had when we thought about this book, and really, uh, it's, it's, it's great that Marcus said, We've been working on it. It's, it's, it's right, I, I'd forgotten since 2011. I mean, it's an immensely long time that we've been thinking about this. Um, and uh, it's not easy to work out all these, these differences. So uh, the, the question of there being different French and German and uh, Anglo-American visions of how economics operate, that's the, the really the core message of the book. Um, it's something that we also felt when we were uh, preparing the uh, the, the book. Um, we, we start off uh, by thinking that contrary to much received wisdom, particularly here among American economists, but also among British economists in the UK, uh, that the euro is not a disaster. Um, uh, it's not a failed experiment. Um, it's a coordination exercise uh, that was intended to overcome coordination problems. There are still coordination problems, uh, but it's a, an ongoing process. And uh, we thought also, and we deal quite extensively in the book, uh, uh, the book has two big subsections uh, on the various problems that were in the institutional setup of Maastricht. Um, uh, on the fiscal rules and on the financial system. And Marcus is going to talk about those at greater length. Um, uh, but we thought that fundamentally it's not just a question of institutional design, but it's a question of different ideas. Um, and again, Marcus is going to go into this in, in greater length, uh, but the ideas look really starkly contrast, uh, contrasted across the River Rhine. Um, economists like to think of rules versus discretion. And the German side of the Rhine is very much a rule-based view. And the French side is very much a discretion-based uh, uh, view. And some people think that this is the result of the different political setups uh, because the Federal Republic of Germany is a federal country and Germany, with the obvious brief uh, exception of the terrible years of the Nazi dictatorship, has always been a very federal uh, country. Um, and in a federal country, as in the United States or in Switzerland, you really need many, many more rules in order to work out how the different bits of the federation relate to each other. Whereas in a very centralized country, and France is probably the most centralized country uh, that you can think of, that I as a historian can think of anyway, um, it's much easier for the person in the center, the Sun King or the President of the Republic, who in many ways is the kind of version of the Sun King updated to the 21st century, um, to snap their fingers and s make things different. Um, and so th th that translates very immediately into the question of how you deal with uh, economic and financial crises. Um, the French view is fundamentally a view that emphasizes that a crisis is a liquidity crisis, and so you can overcome a crisis by just injecting a tremendous amount of liquidity, um, and you can shift 
uh, in between multiple equilibria. You can be stuck in a bad equilibrium, uh, but you can, by the action of a uh, central authority, uh, you can get into a good equilibrium. And uh, the, the concept of multiple equilibria is difficult to sell in Germany. Uh, the Germans tend to think of issues as fundamentally in terms of solvency. Uh, they think of a liability principle. Again, Marcus is going to develop that theme a bit. Um, uh, and if it's a solvency issue, um, then the injection of liquidity doesn't do any good. It just wastes money and you make the situation in the end just more difficult and more costly uh, to, to resolve. Um, so th 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 those are the, some of the, uh, the contrasts. Um, it relates also to the approach to fiscal policy uh, that the French side tends to be more Keynesian. The German side is suspicious of Keynesian stimulus for the same kinds of reasons as really permeate this rule-based view of the world. Um, and you might think uh, then that these, these contrasting views, it's, 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 it's absolutely impossible to bring them together. And so, in some senses, you know, there's a very, very famous book uh, by the pop psychologist uh, John Gray about um, men being from Mars and women being from Venus. And then um, uh, Bob Kaplan applied that to the transatlantic relationship. And we think that there's something like this in the European relationship that uh, the French and the Germans are, as it were, from different planets. Um, and uh, if that's the case, then there's a... I mean, is, is, is it possible to do marriage therapy? I mean, this, this is in effect what the book is trying to do. Uh, is, is it possible to do some kind of uh, marriage therapy? Uh, because if you get compromises between these two contrasting views, sometimes the compromises can be good, but sometimes they can be really terrible. And when we narrate the story of the Euro crisis, um, it's the terrible nature of some of those compromises that we highlight. Um, it, for, for us, the first really big event of the Euro crisis, of the debt crisis, that made it into a really systemic Europe-wide crisis, rather than being something that was confined to Greece and to Ireland, which had very specific uh, problems, uh, was the decision in October 2010, which was taken bilaterally uh, by uh, the President of the French Republic, Nicolas Sarkozy, and the German Chancellor, Angela Merkel, um, a decision that they didn't discuss before with the other members of the European Union, 28 countries in the European Union, um, or the uh, other members of the Eurozone, 18 and 19 uh, members of the, of, the, of the Eurozone. And that compromise looked like this. Um, that the French didn't like the rigorous approach to fiscal rules and wanted a watering down of the fiscal framework. Um, but the Germans wanted something in return. Angela Merkel wanted something in return. In the aftermath of the global financial crisis, uh, w she pushed for a private sector involvement of the banks uh, so that the uh, banks, if they lent to governments that were fundamentally insolvent, uh, would have to pay some kind of price for that. But then people said, if you do this immediately, it's going to create a panic. And so the agreement was to postpone it for three years. But if you announce that you're going to do something in three years' time, the effect is immediately uh, to get those reactions. And the, the idea of the measure was really quite simple, that it would apply market discipline uh, to countries in Southern Europe, in peripheral Europe, uh, where the fiscal discipline, the rules, had failed. Um, but the consequence was a, a widening uh, of the crisis. So, you know, if you start off with this, um, it, looks, it looks pretty terrible. And it looks as if the idea of this marriage counselling 
is really not going to work. Um, so you might say, if we start off with this view that it's, it's fundamentally differences of ideas rather than differences of interest that can be brokered over and negotiated over, if it's fundamentally differences of ideas, then isn't it all hopeless and shouldn't the Europeans give up on this? Um, well, that's where we thought it's important to think of the deep history of this because it's not true that the French have always thought in the one way and that the Germans have always thought in the other way, that the French have always been concerned with discretion and the Germans have maniacally enforced the rules. In fact, in the 19th century, it was really the other way around. And uh, France was the great country of economic rules, the country that gave you the word laissez-faire, the country of Bastia and Say and later Le Roi Beaulieu, a classic economic liberalism um, of um, rules, laws that would constrain the state. And Germany was the country where the state gave the initiatives and molded the course of industrialization, used tariff policy in order to develop a particular kind of export strategy. Um, so something went wrong with that in the middle of the 20th century. And it's really the reaction to the fundamental economic and social political collapse of the 1930s and 1940s that produced in both countries a change of mind. The German response, economists, political scientists, lawyers, thinking about what you needed to learn from the horrors of the Nazi experiment of the dictatorship was that you must ensure that states are not arbitrary, that states act according to an adherence to general rules, to universal rules, that they don't single out particular companies or sectors or groups uh, for, for being privileged. Um, and so the, the, the rule-based view is um, very much a view that comes in opposition and reaction against the experience of the Nazi dictatorship. Um, it's actually qu quite interesting. Um, yesterday we were talking about this and we had a lot of discussion about the Italian case. Um, in Italy, there's a similar reaction uh, to the experience of fascism and the great economist and uh, first leader of the Banca d'Italia, then president of the Italian Republic, Luigi Anaudi, is very much uh, in exactly the same position of thinking about rules as a defense against state arbitrariness and as a response to the legacy of fascism. But in France, things look very different uh, because in France, uh, the memory is of the political and military collapse in 1940. And uh, the story in France is that uh, the collapse of 1940 was due to the application of orthodox economics and to austerity and to limited budgets. Um, in the 1930s, there was a, what was called then super deflation or austerity uh, under Pierre Laval. Um, and in the circumstances of the 1930s, most of the government spending uh, discretionary spending that can be altered by governments was military spending. And so the uh, military spending that was cut then as a result of the austerity measures made France vulnerable in 1940 to the German military attack. Um, and there was a sense in 1940 that the whole political and economic system of the Third Republic had been discredited and that you needed to move to something that would produce more economic dynamism more state-centered uh, growth model um, and get out of this individualistic society that had been so vulnerable in the 1930s and had been defeated in May 1940. Um, so what's the lesson of that history? Um, it, it is, I think, uh, that in a fundamental crisis, in a really existential crisis, there's a rethinking of ideas and if you think now, and we're not only several years into the book, but several years into the Euro crisis, 
In 2014, 2015, the environment really shifted and it's not just an economic crisis anymore and uh, the European discussion is about debt and about the way in which you produce an institutional answer. But it's also about security issues in the wake of the invasion and annexation of Crimea, the fighting in eastern Ukraine, the disintegration of Libya and Syria, the refugee streams. Um, these are all uh, big challenges to, to Europe. Um, and the thought is that it may be that it's actually easier to confront some of the issues and to rethink some of the issues in the light of this environment of multiple crises because, for instance, just to take a, an obvious approach to this, um, if you say, I think correctly, that a monetary union requires some sort of fiscal union as well, this was the case that the economists, particularly American economists, had been making. Um, it's very, very hard to sell that to the voters. Uh, they don't understand why you need uh, more fiscal integration um, for the sake of a maybe a little bit abstract economic theory. Uh, but if you say you've got this really big problem, and it's particularly in two of the crisis countries in Italy and in Greece, uh, with refugees and how refugees are dealt with, um, how the humanitarian problems are resolved, um, then it becomes much easier uh, to think of coordinated fiscal action. Similarly, if you think of the energy vulnerability that the security crisis lays open, it really calls for big infrastructure investment um, in order to bring together the different really quite seg segregated and separated energy markets in Europe. Um, and again, that's going to be a, a, a common task. So uh, we think that at the end of this story, um, uh, th there may well be, and actually we see signs that there is the beginning of this uh, rethinking uh, of the different approaches. And in that sense, um, this is the moment to lay out the differences between France and Germany, lay out these intellectual differences, because it's only by laying them out and by understanding them that you can, in the end, come and resolve them. So, ca can I leave it to Marcus now to give you the, the details on our, we, because we actually have some concrete proposals as well, so Marcus is going to tell you about that.